most original talk radio station anywhere. We are LA Talk Radio at latalkradio.com. You're listening to Oscar's Guitar Shop with Oscar Jordan right here on LA Talk Radio. You see that? I'm smart, stunned him. I slammed in the nose. Fucks you all up. Get that pain shooting through your brain, your eyes fill up with water. That ain't any kind of fun. But what I have to offer you, that's as good as it's gonna get. And it won't ever get that good again. <laughs> Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another episode of Oscar's Guitar Shop. I'm Vintage Guitar Magazine contributing writer Oscar Jordan, and I am burdened with glorious purpose. I'll take you to the pilot of your soul and get to the crux of the biscuit. But on this very special episode of Oscar's Guitar Shop, we're exploring the sacred groove. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. So strap in, lube up, and brace for impact. That's right, thank you. I love you too. I love you too. No, sit down. Oh, roses. Oh, I don't deserve all of this. You're, you're just too kind. Damn sycophants. Hey. Oscar's Guitar Shop is powered by Analog Man Guitar Effects, providing everything you need between your amp and guitar. Visit them at analogman.com. Also, sixstring.com, the social network app for guitarists, all guitar, all the time. Also, True Tone Music at truetonemusic.com, making your music come to life. And now, it's time. George Lynch has one of the most recognizable guitar styles in the universe. Throughout the 80s, he influenced an entire generation of guitarists in the world of hard rock and metal, and we've never been the same. His inventive guitar work led to a Grammy nomination and a career that's been going strong for over 35 years. Furious George has recorded over 40 albums with Dokken, Lynch Mob, Souls of We, Lynch Pilsen, TNN, and a plethora of side projects and albums in which he guest starred. He's an artist, a devout ESP guitar disciple, a custom guitar builder, inventor of the gothic octave scale, and a documentary filmmaker. His passion for the plight of Native Americans and social environmental injustice is examined in his de- directorial debut in the documentary film Shadow Train Under a Crooked Sky. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my complete honor to introduce Mr. George Lich. Yeah. Okay. Mr. George. Lynch, 
I'm sorry, Captain George Lynch. Doctor do I, do I get to George. Speak now? No, you're not yet. Doctor George Lynch. How about Emperor of the Universe? Emperor of the Universe, Mr. George Benevolent Lynch. dictator. God of Empire. mankind, Mr. George <laughs> And that's an understatement. Yeah, I think that was pretty much all a little overwhelming and, and all an overstatement, but I appreciate it. It made me sound like a renaissance man, which I well, thank you for. This is, this is the reality yeah. of your world, Mr. Lynch. Well, when you come to my house and you see the reality of my world, it's, it's not that – doesn't look anything like that, but go ahead. But it's great. It looks good on paper, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when you wax eloquently like you did at the front of the show, I just got to say you got a tongue prettier than a twenty-dollar whore. <laughs> Rip that right out of Blazing Saddles. That's a compliment. <laughs> I think so. If you're a whore. <laughs> True. And whores, you know. Are we all? Yes. Yes. Are we all? We all are whores, and you know. Slaves to the empire. And in, uh, as you know, it's hard out there to be a pimp. So tell me, George, what is going on in your life? You're the busiest man. Uh. Well, one of the things I'm doing is changing my name. Okay. Because George is kind of not cool. So I was thinking, Gene Simmons gave me a name once. Oh, yeah. What do he call you? John Lynx, J-O-N-L-Y-N-X. That is very cool. And he just came up with that off the top of his head. Damn, that's that's pretty yeah, happy. Yeah, he's a gifted man. Well, hey, let's get down to brass tacks, okay? To the what inside skinny, to the, the straight dope. Let's get down to it. Okay, first off, um, well, I'm going to get to the good stuff because uh, we had Doug Pinnock on last week, oh, who man. is the most amazing man in the world mm-hmm. and who is living proof that black don't crack because he's like 99 years old, but yet he looks like a 40-year-old man. He does. So it's true. Black don't crack. Uh, you're doing a record with him and the drummer from Korn, uh, Ray Luzier. Is that how I pronounce his last name? Well, it's not Loser. It's not Loser? But it's close. Loser? Loser? <laughs> Looser. Looser. Okay. No, it's Loser. Is that Lusier. some kind of French name or something? I think so. I think so. Well, those yeah. French. Hey, Lusier. we saved him in World War II and they never forgot He's a it. Midwest boy. But he's a great guy. Great well, what, guy. What, what is that like? I, I'll tell you. I'm pinching myself and I'm, you know, just trying to keep everything cool because, um, you know, I, I've been on an eternal search since I've started playing guitar in bands and when I was a teenager for that group of friends that I could share the journey with, and that's all it's really ever been about for me. It's become about other things, of course, in the course of my career, but, you know, making money and making records and being on tour and raising a family and having music support that family, but at you know, the foundation of all of it is really just playing with your friends, like when you used to, you know, meet up with friends in school, and one guy played drums, one guy played bass, and you'd go over to one of your buddy's garages, and you'd play, and you'd have these dreams, and of, you know, doing something someday, not for money, but for music, and uh, I'm still there, I haven't changed at all from that, and it's, and I'm glad I haven't, but it's been very elusive, and in the few times I've, I've had that experience of that kind of camaraderie with, you know, a band of brothers, um, it's always fallen apart, and um, so uh, I don't want to give up on the dream, and uh, KXM, which is the band that I have with Ray Lazier and Doug Pinnock, is that right now. Um, we don't know where it's going to go. We're just finishing up the record. But right now we're all real happy. So, as I said, I'm pinching myself. And you you like the way things are sounding? Boof. Come on. It's Doug Pinnock. What am I saying? How could Silly me. I mean, you know, Doug could sing over a turd. It would sound beautiful. Come on. <laughs> I mean... Just, I mean, yes, we put eight days into the record. I, I was telling you this earlier. Um, it is regretful to me that um, because of everything we all got going on in our lives and our business, that we didn't have more time to dedicate to something that I feel is um, deserves more time. But uh, without any excuses, I would say that I'm really excited about the record. We captured a moment in eight days. We wrote a whole album's worth of material from scratch and recorded it. Mm-hmm. You don't get any awards for that but you do get some gratification. And then and the, there's the energy and the, the kind of uh, inspiration you get. From you got it. what you got, yeah. including the mistakes, which I'm fine with. There, I, There's a clip of you guys uh, with Billy Sheehan on bass uh, doing some tunes at the NAMM show. Yeah, it was just kind of a thrown together uh, NAMM jam thing. You know, but if that, that's a preview, it, the sound is great. I mean, you your, your, your guitar is mm. just killing all over it. You know, you're uh, doing Manic that, Depression. Yeah. And you, well, you even started some James Brown song. You know what? And they wouldn't <laughs> jump in on that. And I'm like, are you guys kidding me? 
We could have played I Feel Good with <laughs> Doug Pinnock and Ray Lazier and, and, and Billy Sheehan. And we had a whole house, full house. And I'm like, are you kidding me? We could have just take, definitely shake some asses. But, you know, they wanted to stick to all that freaking uh, 80s just, white boy rock. And I was just like, come on. The, the, juxta, the, the, the juxtaposition of you playing Jimmy Nolan guitar parts on your uh, your ESP. I'll pretend you know. to know who he is. <laughs> it's your job he's, to know that. It's not he's my the, job. Wow, the James Brown guitar player. You really? Know? Yeah, you're playing oh, um, all that. that cool stuff. Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. Well, that's it. Sounded really cool though. I wish you guys would have kept going because it's. Uh... <laughs> well, we stopped in the in uh, when we were playing Blind by Corn and Head came up and joined us and we had no idea because Ray failed to tell me that Head sings all Jonathan's parts too he can sing all that stuff so we could have played the whole song and we just kind of stopped and then he said hey by the way we could have finished the song I'm like ah oh. you know whatever hindsight is 2020 yeah next so, name dude can can you give <laughs> us any idea when this uh, project will see daylight um well we're just finishing up the third song right now and uh, so there's a bit of work to do I mean all the tracks have been laid I'm starting solos actually Monday so I got uh, 18th through the 28th. I'm just got 11 days of guitar, not specifically just for KXM, but I'll have all the guitars done. And uh, then we're it's off to after the mix, we're off to shopping it, and uh, we've got a lot of interest. So we'll we'll see where it goes. Right. And also you mentioned okay, because you said you're laying down guitars, but not just for KXM. Hmm. As we spoke earlier, and I knew this because I am an intense kind of uh, surgical reporter, and I know about uh, infidels. Mm, the infidels. The infidels. Uh, you're playing with the band War. Well, it's it's uh, Sal and Poncho from War. Right. Which is the bass player and the drummer. And so, what's what's that going to be like? I mean, that's. Uh, that's it's, be it sounds like well, it's 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 uh, it's instrumental and it's heavy funk. And it's just all groove-based, ass-shaking, heavy riffs, and lots of jamming. Wow. Big extended jams. Man, how did yeah. you guys get together for that? Huh? Hell if I know. Uh, let's see. Poncho is an ESP endorser. Uh-huh. Always running into him at ESP. You know, we sat down a couple times and just started noodling around, and we're just like, and Poncho's a great guy. He's got great energy. And he's just, dude, we got to do something. So we started thinking maybe we'll do throw a clinic band together you know, uh, ESP clinic band and go out and, or, or whatever. We, we didn't, we weren't sure. And then ESP put us in the studio for two days at a very nice studio. And we just came up with like five or six things that we, uh, threw down. Some of it's kind of trower esque uh, Hendrix ish. Um, you know, some sly influence, some James Brown influence, some Santana influence. So, you know, a lot of percussion going on. I mean, all that kind of stuff, all the kind of stuff I've always wanted to do and never got a chance to do because, I'm playing with uh, people that don't do that a lot of times. You know, I I think uh, people who don't are aren't really really into you as I am don't know how open you are as a musician. A lot of people standing outside, oh he's that 80s guy with the hair. If they even and know the who belly the hell shirt. I am, right. Well, but the I mean the belly shirt. The belly shirt. That was a long time ago. Breaking the chains, you know. Oof. You physically actually broke the chains in that video. Well, they were studio chains that were meant to break very easily. Nevertheless, still, uh, there was a belly shirt involved. What? Uh, yeah. Well, was. at least I wasn't Dawn with the uh, leg makeup. Well, my point being, Mr. Lynch, <laughs> is that they see you in this way as this 80s Mr. Lynch, dude, by the way. Mr. George Lynch. And, uh, call me what my family calls me at home. What do they call you? Shithead. Oh, I can't do that, sir. I'm a That's fan. Okay. Don't call me sir. Don't call me mister. Don't call me George. I don't well, like George either. Call me honey. Well, what people That's what I make my should know me. is that you... You're you're more than docking. I mean, in, obviously obviously you are, but you got some Hendrix going on. I, I've I've heard you play with a rap band at the Key Club. I've heard you do all kinds of stuff. Uh, oh right, yes, right. I yes, yes. You played with this hip hop guys, and they were rapping over Lynch riffs. Right. Uh, that was that was a song called Smoke This, which I wrote and was on a record called Smoke This in about 2000. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was actually my brother-in-law and uh, the other rapper and his other kind of rage ma- against the machine band that they have. And they record at my studio sometimes. And uh, it was funny because we were opening up for Ingve, So we had a full house at the Key Club. Ingve 
crowd, <laughs> which is not very open to anything but, you know, a thousand miles a minute guitar solos and, you know, whatever kind of rock and roll you call that. But, uh, yeah, we went out there and funked it all up and they were like, huh? Some people were into it. There was some, I was there into was, it. I was there. I was on the side of the stage, and there was some head scratching going on because mm-hmm. these guys with very large pants came on stage, and they were <laughs> using hand signs and speaking in rhyme while yeah. furious George Lynch rips it erupted was. from the amplifiers. You'd think, and I always assumed that uh, rock and roll and music fans and people that appreciate art in general would be more open to everything. And actually, I found that the opposite... The opposite is, tends to be true, that, that rock listeners are, and fans tend to be very conservative and restricted in their kind of willingness to open up, you know, their eyes and ears and minds to anything other than what they're used to, which is um, kind of hit me on the side of the head like a sledgehammer. I, I, I never ex- would have thought that that is even possible. So when I started playing other music outside of the context of Doc and, or Lynch Mob um, and found that there was really nobody listening <laughs> or caring. Um, I, I still haven't figured that out. I, I don't know why that is. It's, it's you know, it's about the fans. I mean, somewhere there's a, a 50-year-old guy in Cleveland who wants you to play Paris is Born and Burning exactly like the record. They just, they just, well, they, you, know, they, you touch their it, lives. I've and, never played it just like the record since I played it the first time when we wrote it in Exciter, which was before Dawkins in 1977. Mm-hmm. And I ain't going to start playing it right now, so... There you go. Because yeah. that's because you're a real live human being and you are not a replicant. I'm not a robot. You're not. You're a I'm free a man. <laughs> and speaking of free man, I'm going to play this song because uh, we were talking about Doug. And correct me if I'm wrong, and I know you will. This song features Doug Pinnock on vocals. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah. This song is uh, Tooth and Nail. To the yeah. nail. From the album Slave to the Empire. <laughs> George Solo, dude I love that shit I'm, I know I, But I gotta do a commercial I'll do a commercial Alright You guys uh, buy this record. It's uh, it's called Slave to the Empire. What's the name of the band? T and N. 
Uh, I love this shit. I grew up listening to this, all that, that, all those docking records. Uh, I saw you. I should have brought my ticket stub so you can sign it. Uh, you opened for Dio back then, and then I saw you open for Aerosmith. I was in Chicago, Rosemont Horizon back in the day, man. Anyway, I got to do a commercial because I got to pay the bills. True Tone Music is a virtual candy store for guitarists and bass players. They're world famous for having the best selection of new, used, and vintage guitars in the Los Angeles area. Located at 714 Santa Monica Boulevard in the city of Santa Monica, True Tone Music offers the widest selection of exceptionally high-quality guitars and basses. They stock name brands like Fender, Gibson, Guild, Epiphone, Gretsch, and much more. It's where the top names in the music industry shop for guitars, basses, amps, boutique pedals, and accessories. Whether you want to buy, sell, trade, get guitar lessons or repairs, True Tone Music's super cool staff is there to make your music come to life. You better believe it. They'll also match any online price and back it up with top-notch customer support and service. Visit them online at truetonemusic.com or call 310-393-8283. That's 310-393-8283. Ask for Ken. Tell him Oscar sent you. Yeah, well, you that was... Uh, huh? You get a kickback? Yeah, yeah. I get... Yeah. Uh, I get a shoulder rub, basically, out of that, you know, because he's a very sensuous man, that guy. Anyway, so... Um, I've heard of that place. Yeah, I bought, I bought a pedal there once. I, they awesome. have cool... I'm telling you, I, you know what? I'm not going to have anybody on the show who just blows, and, and True Tone Music is, is top of the food chain. They have great stuff, and... So if Guitar Center called you, just blow them off. I would right? blow them off, because I'm not that man. I, I will not be owned by the man, you know? Yeah, we're not fans of the big boxes, Exactly. Are we? So, But True Tone is... Mom and Pop. They're, they're legendary. And, and, of course, one of my favorite TV shows they filmed there, uh, Californication. They did an episode there. Oh. So I'm just sharing. Anyway, they're really good. Um, I want to get into um, TNN because uh, you decided to take back your music <laughs> and re-record it and add more stuff to it. Tell me the process with that with uh, um you're, well, you're base T- player. TNN is is uh, Jeff Pilson, Mick Brown, and myself from Dokken, Uh Without Dawn, originally. Or the working title of the record was Dump the Chump. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, when we played together in the 80s, and then again in the 90s, from 94 to 97, we always, really, what we always enjoyed doing was just the three of us playing, whether it was at rehearsal, or in the studio, or writing songs, wherever we happened to be writing, or even live, when Don would just kind of walk off and we would just take off and do, do you know, improvise or come up with a new riff and just play something nobody ever heard before. That, those were the special moments. And we always vowed that we would do this someday when Dawkins was kind of dead and gone. So we thought, okay. And um, we finally have that opportunity. And I mean, 25 years later, I guess it's been. But um, So that's what this is. It's uh, what I believe is the heart and soul of Dawkins. Um, what was good about it. Uh, the chemistry. I mean, when we get in a room, we laugh, we joke, uh, we come up with beautiful music, and it's just we've got a chemistry that that's after, even after all these years, it's one day back together. It's like right there, you know. It's so great, and uh, so I miss that. And uh, we have so much history together. Obviously, I mean, we, Jeff and I are still very, very good friends. As as are Mick and I. Uh, Mick lives in out in Arizona, is playing with Ted Nugent. Um, <clears throat> Jeff's in Foreigner. So that is the one challenge with this band is to try to find a way to get out on the road enough to support the records and and play a meaningful amount of dates uh, with the fact that, you know, Mix and Ted Nugent and Jeff's and Foreigner, that makes it rough. But we're we're finding a way. We actually plan on going out uh, this fall. Uh, I think we're doing Loud Park in Japan, which is a big festival, and uh, probably a month and a half of dates, something like that. Uh, here in the States, maybe a little bit of Europe. And we're already working on the second record. Um, we have all the docking stuff recorded, and we're working on the original music now. And so that'll be released in the fall as well. So we'll have a second TNN record out. And do you care what Don Dockin feels? I I care what everybody feels and nobody feels. I mean, it would, I mean, I care what people feel, including yourself or anybody else. I mean, the guy on the street, my kids. My wife, my friends, people in the band, 
uh, the manager, the, the critics, the radio stations. But at the same time, um, you know, you can never make music by committee because then you've just depersonalized it. I mean, the whole point is to play what you feel, you know. Yeah. And once you stop doing that and trying to get everybody else's uh, approval, I mean, then you've, you're just watering everything down and, you know, record by committee, man, doesn't work. Well, last time I interviewed you, I mean, I don't want to go on and on about Don Dockin. I don't want to, but, but I just going for, to. But uh, just for a nanosecond. You you told me that uh, I interviewed you for uh, Vintage Guitar Magazine, and you said you had you had to re-record Mr. Scary mm. because they would not allow you to use it for a movie. So you re-recorded a version of it, Mr. Mr. Scary 2 or something like that. Uh, and it's because Mr. he Scary. wouldn't allow he wouldn't allow them to release it or something like that. It was some kind of crap. Yeah, like that. it was some. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> That's like, I, I really don't want to. Get it's kind of douchey, that, so. isn't it though? Yeah, well, you know. That's probably why we're not playing. Because you'd all make money from it. Sure. But yeah. no, I do not want us to make money. You know, I've been in a lot of bands. I've been played with a lot of people, and um, there is a certain thing that you see happen quite a bit. It's probably in all kinds of businesses, not just music business. But you know, sometimes people just want to win, and sometimes want people just want to be the big dogs, whether they deserve to be or not. And, right. And so it becomes these these ego and power struggles that are just ridiculous, and are nothing about the music. I mean, there is a natural hierarchy in any kind of an organization. Mm-hmm. And if you can just strip out the damn ego, everybody does the best they can. They do their thing, and we all support each other. In other words, if you've got what you consider a weak link in the band, let's say, uh, you know, whatever, the, 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 tri- the, the tambourine player isn't that great, okay? But you're like, okay, but he's an essential element of the band. He does what he does. You know, everybody gets an equal share. Everybody works to their abilities as best they can, as long as they do that. Everything's fine. If one person is more gifted than the other or is more recognized in the marketplace than the other, then that's good for the band, as long as it doesn't go to their head. The problem is when it goes to people's heads or they want to have an artificial hierarchy that sort of conflicts with the natural hierarchy. That's where you get problems, and that's I've seen that a lot. Yeah. I, I, and it gets down to human nature, which gets into a different subject, which is the film that, I were, that we're working on right now, Shadow Train, which deals with those kinds of issues. And I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't know segue. how to, I was going to transition into that. I was going to do yeah. some kind of segue is my middle name. Yes, you are a captain Segway. <laughs> um, I saw the videos that you, the clips you have on YouTube of uh, Shadow Train, and it's really, really cool. And it, and it really talk about learning more about George Lynch. Uh, you know, you're you're a filmmaker. You're a documentary filmmaker. No. You're 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 I'm you're, not. you're directing and um you're you're talking about the plight of the Native Americans. I misdirecting. Uh, well, and, it looks uh, good, man. It's shot really well. The, the editing is good, and uh, we have we have good people working with us. Uh, give us give us a synopsis about what this documentary uh, what, is about. My, my one liner is it's an exploration of human nature through the lens of the Native American experience, the indigenous experience. It could be about any Native population, and uh, it's very political in nature, historical in nature. Uh, we have uh, a musical band called Shadow Train which is a highly improvisational band, and we, we travel throughout uh, different parts of the United States going to uh, mostly Native American reservations and, and poor communities, and we play music. Uh, and uh, we in, in our travels, we, we, we interview, we have uh, spiritual uh, sort of roundhouses and, and have had a lot of experiences and adventures that we a lot of which we couldn't plan on uh, plan for. They just sort of happened to us, and we're capturing that. Uh, these experiences, and um, trying to cobble it into a film, which is uh, my first film. I mean, it's just mine. I mean, everybody involved. Uh, and as you mentioned, I'm a director. Well, I'm. I'm I don't know. I mean, I don't know what even what that means. Uh, but I, you know, I'm doing everything. We all do everything. You know, I'm. I'm the guy. You know, filling up the trailer with tires and putting gas in it, and you know. Figuring out logistics and setting up schedules and writing music and recording studios and helping with, you know, get the editing together and, and all the logistics and the travel and the budgets and raising money and, uh, you know, publicity, which is what I'm doing right now. Right. I'm talking about the film. And what I would like to mention is that um, two things. One is we've got some wonderful notables involved in the film uh John Trudell, who was the first uh, American Indian Movement leader, 
uh, occupier at Alcatraz and has, you know, I mean, he's uh, so, some uh, is a whole image mean, just make a film on John. I mean, he's incredible. We're, we'll be going up to Alcatraz soon to visit Alcatraz uh, 35 years after uh, the uh, occupation occurred. Um, I also wrote a song with him called Trail of Tears, which you're, I think you're going to play it a bit of later. Um, we've got Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine in the film. We've got Surge from System of a Down. We've got Noam Chomsky, which was, you know, uh, a, a huge honor for me to be in his presence. Um, not that that was the point, but um, it was for me a personally rewarding moment in my life. Uh, he's a, uh, a hero of mine and should be to everybody. <clears throat> and he's quite old now, so probably won't be with us much for much longer, but I, I, I hope that's not true, but left a huge, important body of work in activism that uh, has uh, been a sort of a guiding light and example for the rest of us, I think. And, um, uh, and we are uh, trying to raise money to, uh, we're trying to raise $15,000 for the editing, which is very expensive, obviously, and the, the film can you know, live or die in editing. And I've come to learn, understand that and learn that in the process, the two-year process of making the f this film so far. We have six months left in the process of making the film. And we have an Indiegogo campaign. And people can find that by going to Indiegogo slash Shadow Train. And if they uh, feel like donating uh, a little bit of money towards the effort, uh, we give uh, prizes, or whatever you want to call it, gifts. Uh, $10 will get you a sh uh, uh, this custom, really cool Shadow Train guitar pick. All the way up to the the, the biggest uh, gift for the largest donation, which I think is a thousand or two thousand dollars. Well, actually, much less than that. I think you you get a Skype guitar lesson with me. Mm. Uh, you get your name in the credits of the of the movie and the record. And the record is, by the way, will be done tomorrow. Um, that's a whole other subject, I guess. Great. I'm I'm, I'm kind of going off on different tangents here. It's I'm cool. sorry. It's I got cool. a lot to talk about. Uh, I want I want to play a track. Uh, this is called uh, Prayer Mechanism. And this is from uh, Shadow Train. our sponsor i've discovered the coolest app for guitarists it's called six string and it's available at the itunes store six string is the ultimate mobile app for ipad and iphone users the six string app is a social network just for guitarists six string has the fastest growing community of guitarists on the internet and it's free to join free imagine the coolest people in the world talking about guitar and nothing but guitar all on your mobile device. Users can post photos of their gear, audio and video files with hot licks or text messages. You can also post your favorite YouTube videos and make new friends. The best part is that downloading the app is free and easy to use. The Six String community is a great place to interact with guitarists, find fans of your playing, or become a fan. Recording with the Six String app is a breeze and allows you to post your ideas immediately. It's free for download at the iTunes store or go to sixstring.com to get more information. That's S I X S T R I N G dot com. Say hi to Pete Thorne, Zach Wilde, and Jennifer Batten, who are also on the app. Sixstring.com, the social network for guitarists. All guitar, all the time. 
I like that track. I like how you uh, you, you blended, blended the Native American, uh, the chants and the guitar. Uh, yeah. But I got to yeah. tell you, you have such a specific guitar sound that, it, like, I was not lying. When I did the introduction, we could be on the LV-426 in the Delta Quadrant, and somebody would play some guitar licks, and they would say, "That's you have to hypersleep for, like, three years to get there. Oh, you're just making up a fictitious place. No, in it's a real space. place. LV-426. You ever watch Aliens? Is it near Uranus? No, nowhere near my <laughs> anus. It's a Uranus. <laughs> hey, what kind of joint is this? That lady just here? looked at us weird when you said that. Leave is my anus out of this. <laughs> but, no, I'm just saying, I, I, especially people in the guitar community, oh, that's George Lynch. I swear to God. And and you know that. You got to know that. But, oh, sure. But, they, but it's, it's like it's a trademark thing. And uh, and it's so weird because when I whenever I talk to you, you talk about you know you're an old school guy from the 70s and you know you're into Hendrix and all the 70s guys. I'm like, dude, I don't hear it. It sounds like you just popped out of the ground with your own thing, you know. Yeah, and it's well, just it's really mm-hmm. unique, man. When you when you hear the Shadow Train record, which I am actually dying to play for you, um, which I will probably after this interview, I'll just play for you personally so you can hear it. It is very 70s. Most of it is real kind of classic oriented and i think it's the best guitar sound i've ever gotten in my life actually mm. it, which is was well it was by design i mean there's some science to it but a lot of it is just you know by hit getting lucky you know right and uh i really was very very happy with it and i wanted to play it for you to get your opinion yeah uh it's it just you know it's like they say that the tone is in the hands and um i was reading your guitar player magazine interview that just it's out on the stands now and they talk about oh you know your tone used to be so harsh and in the 80s and i'm sorry i just don't remember your i don't remember you having you know good you know tons of distortion all over your guitar i mean you you played distorted but it was always very smooth and clear and and very and and you're and very spidery. I used to use that word with your your playing Mm. spidery you have a spidery kind of style that's that is always very articulate I think I did use too much distortion. Whoever said that is is right, and I've uh, you know I've been dealing with that you know for 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 decades. I, I mean, disagree. Um, <laughs> well, you know I. I mean I, I mean you know you know I mean, you've you've heard guys that overdo it, and it's like dude you got too much distortion. But you you still you've always had a clarity in the, in your notes. There's always never been mush. There's no uh, mush with George Lynch. It's clarity. Well, I think I've gotten better at. Uh, getting rid of what mush is there. Uh, I'm really playing a lot, lot cleaner the last uh, decade and a half, and, and and continue to do so. And I think it's it's wonderful because it actually what I what I kind of realized at one point in my playing is that I thought, well, um, you know, when I just sit down and play a guitar without an amplifier, that's when I actually play my best. I think because the amp's not getting in the way. I'm just it's just what's in my head and what's in my fingers, and there isn't any tone kind of shoving my direction of my playing any way at all. I can just play what I want. And then when I plug into an amp, if it's a clean amp, I'll play a certain way. If it's a dirty amp, I'll play another way. But it's restrictive. And I think the cleaner the tone, obviously some distortion, but, you know, a very kind of, you know, not square distortion, you know, something mm-hmm. that's very kind of, uh, you know, pleasant. Um but dynamic, that's the thing, you know, and especially that's where I love where Beck's at these days, where it's just so dynamic. I mean, he can, it's so expressive, it's now a voice, you know, and he can tell so many stories and create so much emotion with that, with the with the tools that he has now, because he has this, you know, whether he's using the Octavider or he's using, you know, some kind of synthy kind of effect, whatever it is, or he's just doing all that stuff that he does with the bar and his fingers, you know, it's just insane and and you know and that's he's one of the guys that i've always emulated all my life and um and learned from and continue to learn from yeah nice. and he has evolved and i want to continue to evolve i never wanted to be that guy that got old and was like uh that guy was good but now he sucks he's rich but he sucks <laughs> you know or something not that i'm rich but you know what i'm saying i mean right. these guys that have done it and they just don't evolve it to anything or you know beck has obviously we all guitar players in the guitar community understand that but there's and i don't want to mention any names but there's other guys from that era you know the four horsemen that 
that didn't, and I, I just don't understand that. It's just well, I think mystifying. it's more common than not to. I mean, once you get your thing, then people that's what people know you by, and that's they really don't evolve beyond that. And it's, that's what's so rare for Jeff Beck to just be a whole different person. Because I I'm one of those guys that the greatest day of my life is when Jeff Beck met Jan Hammer. Yeah, that's that's where I live. I, and I know people was... love the blues stuff, but hey, you know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I, I'm sorry to cut in because uh, oh, we, we have bills. we have a time thing, but I want to play some George Lynch mush, and you probably know this track because you recorded it. It's called uh, Trail, of, Trail Tears. of Tears from the album Shadow Train. Sorry to cut you off. No I got the cops here. Your guitar fits in anywhere. It just fits anywhere. Anyway, I got, let me do a quick commercial, and then we're going to come back. Yeah. Uh, if you truly care about your guitar tone, which George Lynch does, <laughs> then you already know that Analog Man Guitar Effects makes the best stomp boxes in the world. Analog Man Guitar Effects has only one mission, to help you get your sound. They specialize in high-end boutique and custom-made pedals used by the best guitar players in the music business. They manufacture modify, buy, sell, and repair vintage and new effects pedals, and their customer service is tops. Their fuzz pedals, overdrives, compressors, chorus pedals, boosters, and delay pedals are truly awesome and chock full of analog goodness. Visit Analog Man online at analogman.com and check out their huge selection of pedals and accessories. Once again... That's AnalogMan.com. Analog Man Guitar Effects. Everything you need between your guitar and amp. And speaking of Analog Man, I'm going to call him now because I have a, you know, question to ask him about stuff. Are they all natural? Or what natural? The Analog Man pedals. Oh, yeah. Hello, Analog Man. This is Mike. Hey, Mike. This is Oscar from Oscar's Guitar Shop here with uh, George Lynch. And George Lynch has a question about your pedals. Hello, gentlemen. George, loved what you said about Jeff Beck. Yeah. <laughs> well, I right think, or wrong? I think I'm speaking for for all of us. Yeah. Speaking for all the guitarists in the world. <laughs> although, although I have to say that I always thought that Jeff Beck was the greatest terrestrial guitar player, but <laughs> but Hendrix was extraterrestrial. This is true. He was the music of the spheres for me. This is true. Yes, yeah, true. Hey, Mike, I have a question. Um, every time I play a gig, people berate me. Because they say, damn, Oscar, you're too loud. Or, damn, Oscar, we can't hear you. What am I doing wrong, man? Boy, man, that is a, that is one of the toughest questions um, for guitarists. And uh, I'm trying to find the solution myself, too. Um, I, you, of course, you've got to hear yourself to be able to play. So you've got to have the amp pointed right at your head. You don't want to be standing on the side of your amp. It's the uh, knob all that, the way on the right. It's called volume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I'm having a problem too because I uh, I think I'm think I'm too loud, but now so now I have the am pointed in my head, and then I'll record a gig and I'll find out that I wasn't loud enough. So there's like that balance between you being able to hear yourself loud enough and you being right in the mix. And you know a lot of guys like me, you know we, we're not we don't have a sound man, 
you got to just count on the, getting the balance right, and it's it, it's really tough. It is. It is. It could be about body placement too. I do that when I do clinics. I don't use in ears. I have wedges. I don't fold the guitar back into the wedges. Just the music, my backing tracks, mm. and then I physically with my body find my sweet spot. Which can change when the room fills up from sound check. Everything changes, as you know, on stage. And you go, wait a minute. Now my guitar is too loud, or the mute, or the tracks are too loud, and I want to embed myself in the track as if I'm. It, like it sounds like a record, you know. So I'm playing live. I just don't want to hear myself. Right. And right. I just move my body position. I do that live when I play with a band too, which is why I usually stand in front of the drums with my back to the audience. Interesting. Can I can I ask you something? Um, some people do not like to hear their guitar coming back in the monitors. How do, how do you feel about that? Um, I think it depends on the situation. I think that I generally don't do that. I like just to hear the natural amp because I like the sound of my speakers mm-hmm. um, in, a, in, a, in a guitar cabinet. I don't want to hear it through horns. You know, right. in, in, you know. So they have these guitar monitors that are uh, Avatar is one of the companies that makes them. There's another one that make that that they've got Celestians in them. They got a 12 or 212 Celestians. And so Even Jeff Beckett sound. is using uh, four monitors for his guitar sound with Celestins in them. Who is that? Jeff Beck uses that now. He's got four monitors in front of him so he can get that feedback and everything, and he's got Celestins in his think, four uh, monitors. Schenker does that as well. I know Mick Mars does that. Because sound men always want you to turn down. And they says, well, turn down and I'll put it in the monitors, but then you get the shitty monitor sound. Right. You know what I mean, and that's, that's which isn't always. Now that's the thing. It depends on the monitor system. Right. If you've got a top of the line Claire Brothers system with big side fills and it's got a lot of low end. Mm, that's actually pretty awesome. But if you you're in a club and they got some crappy PV uh, right. stuff, I mean, maybe you don't want to be in the monitor. So it all depends. It's a, all unique situations. Yeah. What do you Mike. do, Mike? How do you have your setup? Well, um I, just as as I told you, I just kind of have my amp directed at my head. And lately my my drummer has been using in ear monitor, so I do have the amp mic, but um we don't have we don't usually have a a good sound guy with us, so I don't like him to me- be messing with my sound out front. So I'm just hoping I've got my level right, and so far I have not been able to. So I may not be the right guy to to ask. But here's a, here's another interesting thing. Um, if you go on YouTube, there's a, a video of Trey Fish Guitar Rig Part Two, and he has a really interesting monitor setup where he has the key, a keyboard monitor under the key, has the uh, a drum uh, bass monitor on the other side of the stage, and he's got his Amp behind him, so he actually feels everything in, in 3D and positions in his monitors. That may be the ultimate, but not many of us can do that, unfortunately. Wow, yeah, that's true. Well, cool. Well, thanks for the advice, man. I'm going to try that. I got a gig this Sunday in a Nazi sports bar, and uh, it's a very small stage, and uh, I'll see if I can try to get some uh, 3D going on for myself there, you know? What do you mean a Nazi luck. sports bar? <laughs> it's just, oh, you're kidding. It's a, that's that's all I can get, man. You know, I had a I had a <laughs> when, when Lynch Mob first came out with uh, the first record, we wanted to go out and test the waters and play some dates, mm-hmm. but we didn't want to announce it as Lynch Mob because right. we just wanted to be secret dates. Right. So the name of our band was Gay Black Nazi Bikers for Christ. <laughs> and I'm not making that up. I have posters from this from the show. <laughs> well, hey, thanks, Mike. Uh, you can get Mike's stuff has brilliant pedals. You can get them at AnalogMan.com. He's got all the coolest stuff in the world, and uh, I'm gonna get me some of that stuff. Mike, thank well, you George, so much for coming on. Your is working out. Hope to hear it on your new album. Say oh, again? Okay. Oh, we're breaking up here. All right, take care, man. I'll see you next time. Great, thank you. Bye bye. Very cool. All right, for you now we're. Ask me about my equipment. I I have to get to that. Uh, you're using a lunchbox. We know that. Everyone knows you use a lunchbox. LB103. LB103. With uh, my own speakers in the cabinets, which are lunchbacks. Yeah. Celestian lunchbacks. Right. Very cool. Yeah. Lynchbacks. Little, but then every time I see you at, like, when I started the Key Club, you had the Vintage Marshalls. Yeah, I mix it up, you know. I use a combination But you of have, things. like, three heads on stage. Well, that was a long time ago, too. That was before we had the... Uh, when you opened for Ingve. Yeah, that was a long time. That was When the Levy Breaks. You did the Levy... When the Levy Breaks. That was great. <laughs> I did? Oh, shit. I forgot about that. Very cool. Well, know. hey, man, it's time for that uh, wonderful part of the show that everyone's been waiting for. It's time... For the burning question, George Lynch, are you ready for the burning question? You didn't tell me this was going to happen. It is going to happen. Oh, thanks for the surprise. Here's your question, Mr. Lynch. 
George Lynch or Warren D. Martini? What's the difference? It's a burning question. Six of one, half dozen of the other? Yeah. Who's got the better ground game? Uh, I think Warren's a, uh, I think Warren's better. There you go. I agree. He is a better guitarist than you'll ever be, Mr. Lynch. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I he's think also that's, a better person. <laughs> he is, and he's a fine uh, humanitarian. He's better looking, too. I'm going to have him on the show and ask him the same question. Uh, he showers more often than I do. I think he does. That's our show. I'd like to thank our special guest, George Lynch. Set mind to purpose and visit him at georgelynch.com and purchase every piece of music he has ever written. <laughs> Also, I like the sound of your voice when you say my name. You sound like an aristocrat. <laughs> Mr. George Lynch. Yeah, you sound like David Coverdale. Mr. Wow. George Lynch. George, also check out his documentary and the band Shadow Train, wherever coolness can be found. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, Analog Man Guitar Effects, providing everything you need between your amp and guitar at analogman.com. Also... True Tone Music at truetonemusic.com Making your music come to life. Also, sixstring.com The social app for guitarists. All guitar, all the time. Yeah, Tune in next sponsors. week. I got one more thing. I'm almost done. Tune in. Go ahead. Say what we got to say. I said, you got a lot of sponsors. You must be rich. I'm loaded. I have women all over that's the place. you drove up in that Aston Martin. <laughs> yeah, that was my car. That's all, that's all I could get. Nice, dude. I love it. You're welcome. Hey, it's a cool car. Tune in next week where our guest will be Funk Master General and former Earth, Wind, and Fire guitarist Al McKay. Take care of yourselves and be nice to each other. See you next week. Same bat time. Same bat channel. With a kiss of death.